Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblyman Carter. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. And Chair Torres. Thank you and good morning. Welcome to the audience here in Carson City. Those joining us in Las Vegas and those joining us over the internet. Uh, welcome to the fantastic Committee on Government Affairs. A couple of housekeeping items today. Uh, don't forget to silence your electronics devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noise. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name, spell your name, and affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time you are done speaking. Handouts should have been already provided to the committee secretary. There should be 20 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to the committee manager by noon yesterday for members of the committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we may not agree with another person's position. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Public comment will be taken at the end of the meeting. Each person will be limited to two minutes. In addition, the public may submit written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. We do have a pretty full day, so we're going to go ahead and start with the presentation before we move into two different bill hearings. Uh, so we'll go ahead and invite Mr. Kent Lefevre, uh, the Administrator of the State Public Works Division, up to, to complete the presentation. And when you're ready, you may begin. Have a fantastic day. Thank you, Chair Torres and members of the committee. My name is Kent Lefevre and I serve as the administrator of the State Public Works Division. Joining me today is Kirsten Nally, Deputy Administrator of Professional Services for the Division, Dave Dutra, Deputy Administrator for Buildings and Grounds. Dave, raise your hand. Rick Cabley, who is the Deputy Administrator of and, and the building official for the state of Nevada. And Brian Walker, Chief of Planning. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to give you an overview of what Public Works is and does. We hope our presentation is informative and helps the committee understand the important role that we play in the state government. First of all, the legislature has determined that Planning, maintenance, and construction of public buildings is a specialized and complex field. Therefore, the legislature's declared that all planning, construction, and maintenance for the state of Nevada be carried out by the State Public Works Division. Our presentation will be organized as follows. I will go through a brief uh, vision statement, talk about our organization, and then we will talk about professional services, buildings and grounds, and the Compliance Enforcement Unit. Our vision is that state agencies will occupy exemplary facilities, and our mission is to provide well-planned, efficient facilities so that state agencies can effectively administer their programs. Our philosophy is that we work as a team, build consensus, we take pride in our work and serve with humility. Our organization is divided or organized as follows. We are part of the Department of Administration and I report directly to Director Rob. Each section is led by a deputy administrator who then reports to me. Our sections are as follows. Professional services, which includes engineering and planning. We employ licensed and credentialed professionals in a variety of disciplines, including civil, structural, electrical, 
and mechanical engineering and architecture. We also employ industry professionals in pavement, roofing, ADA, and environmental issues. Our deputy over code compliance serves as the building official for the state for state-owned structures on state-owned property. He is supported by building inspectors and other industry professionals. Buildings and grounds is the section that takes care of what we have. Over 66 full-time staff look after our state-owned buildings and facilities on a daily basis. This section includes the Marlette Lake water system, another jewel of the Sierra right in our backyard. I will now introduce Kirsten Nally, Deputy Administrator, to discuss the Capital Improvement Program. Kirsten Nally, for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I will be presenting additional information about the Professional Services section. As Administrator Lefevre explained a moment ago, the mission of the State Public Works Division is to provide well-planned, efficient, and safe facilities to state agencies. This slide shows a recent example of a completed project in Henderson. This is the Health and Sciences Building at the College of Southern Nevada. One of the main functions that this building provides is space at CSN to educate and train nurses. Now I would like to discuss the method used by the division to develop the capital improvement program, what we call the CIP. First, we receive agency requests by April 1 of even numbered years. Last spring, the division received over 700 requests, totaling $1.8 billion. Second, division professionals are assigned a host of projects in order to prepare a scope and project estimate. They then present their findings to a jury of their peers to vet and ensure project accuracy. The projects are then reviewed with agencies who then present selected projects to the State Public Works Board. Based upon these presentations and board approved selection criteria, the State Public Works Board makes its CIP recommendation to the governor on October 1st of even numbered years. The division then supports the governor's CIP recommendation through the legislative session. On July 1 of odd numbered years, the capital improvement projects are official and we begin to proceed. This slide features the newly completed education and academic building at the Nevada State College campus. It's a beautiful building and provides important K through 12 and early development instruction for Nevada's future teachers. There is also a preschool located here providing valuable hands-on experience. One strategy that the professional services group uses is a project manager's general task list. Our project managers follow a rigorous 143 step checklist from project inception to project completion. This document ensures that steps are not missed and that statutes and industry best practices are followed. The division takes a proactive management approach. For example, the division holds weekly staff meetings where each project is reported on to ensure that budget, budgets and schedules are maintained. This slide shows a few more completed projects that are representative of remodel and maintenance projects. The slide on the left shows the Caliente Youth Center gym floor replacement. This project was well received and on opening day, the community actually came out to express their appreciation. And less exciting, but yet just as important, is the photo of the boiler replacement at the Ely State Prison. Our mechanical engineers make this equipment look good. The division coordinates with other state agencies and regulatory bodies throughout the course of a project. Meetings with these agencies shown on the slide are highly coordinated to ensure that buildings are safe and ready to serve their intended purpose. This slide is an image of the new UNLV engineering building that is a 52,000 square foot building currently under construction. 
This project includes both wet and dry labs and research space, facility off faculty offices, and smart class classrooms. This project is on schedule for classes in January of 2024. <coughs> The NRS allows for three different delivery methods for projects. Design, bid, build. This is the traditional method of delivering a project based upon low bidder. Design, build. This method of delivery places the contractor in control of the design and construction. And an example of this method is the, the Bryan Building here in Carson City. The third method is Construction Manager at Risk, or CMAR. This method brings the contractor and the architect together in the beginning stages of design. This building method is best suited for complicated projects like the UNLV Engineering Building, of which we just spoke. Capital improvement projects are funded as follows. State funding, which includes general obligation bonds and general funds, and other funding, which includes highway, federal, and agency funding. I would now like to introduce David Dutra, Deputy Administrator of Buildings and Grounds. Thank you, Kirsten. Madam Chair Torres and members of the committee, uh, for the record, my name is David Dutra, and I am the Deputy Administrator over State Public Works Buildings and Grounds Sections. Uh, I'm going to present a brief overview of the Facility Condition Analysis Group, also known as the FCA program. Our Facility Condition Analysis section fulfills a statutory requirement to complete timely inspections and assess the condition of state-owned properties. Key to the group's mission is the management of its database, which provides critical information necessary for public works to assess planning, responsibilities, and the uh, division's recommendations for CIP maintenance projects, uh, replacement projects. And this aspect of our business uh, makes for a better, smarter plan, planning decisions within the CIP requirements. The facility condition analysis group is responsible for assessing the current condition of state-owned properties totaling 2,357, or 10.1 million square feet of improved space, having an estimated replacement value of $3.4 billion. This is an image of our capital. The division just completed this year a project that refinished the building's exterior. The project is an excellent example of the division's emphasis in taking care of what we have and preserving the state's historic buildings. Buildings and Grounds, or BNG, Facility Management Group is responsible for maintaining 2.1 million square feet of B&G owned space, or in addition, uh, 214 acres of state owned grounds. Equally important is B&G's mission for, uh, to provide custodial services, including cleaning carpets, flooring, windows, and window coverings. B&G's leasing service provides two primary functions. We oversee space in B&G owned buildings and we negotiate and manage all commercial properties under lease to the state agencies. Currently, leasing service is managing 291 commercial leases incorporating 2.1 million square feet of space and assigns, tracks, and manages 1.7 million square feet of BNG owned space occupied by other state agencies. BNG, uh, if BNG cannot locate space within our inventory of buildings, leasing services assists agencies in finding commercial space suitable for their program needs. B&G locates commercial space to meet agency needs and negotiates and manages the lease on behalf of the agency. 
The Marlet Lake, shown here, is without debate a top contender for a must-see destination within the Sierra Nevada mountain range. We have the privilege to be the stewards for this magnificent resource. Operations of the Marlet Lake water system ensures the delivery of raw water to our customers. Buildings and Grounds operates the historic water system comprising of 17 primary features, including the Marlette Lake and dam structure, the Hobart Reservoir and dam structure, and the historic inverted siphon, which is seven and a half miles of pipeline laid in service in 1877. The system utilizes 26 miles of pipeline and roads in order to provide raw water to Carson City, Virginia City, and surrounding communities within Story County. The system is operated as an enterprise fund with operating revenues supported through the sale of water. If you are ever at all interested in touring the facilities and the operation, please contact my office and I'll arrange for that to take place. I would now like to introduce Rick Cabley, our building official. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning, Chair Torres and members of the committee. My name is Rick Cabley, K-A-B-E-L-E, -E, as requested. And I serve as Deputy Administrator of Public Works for Code Compliance and Enforcement. In this position, I also serve as Building Official for state construction projects throughout the state. The State Building Officials team is comprised of 22 certified professionals who work to ensure compliance to approved plans and to enforce state building codes. Further, to ensure that state employees and the public occupy safe buildings. The building official section initiates building permit applications, intakes design documents and submittals, reviews and approves plans and other construction documents. Our section issues building permits for construction, inspects ongoing construction for code compliance and conformance to the approved plans, issues corrective notices when necessary, and issues certificates of occupancy, or as they are known as C C of O's upon the completion of works. All of this is accomplished in a paperless and electronic automated process, which we have inst instituted. In addition to providing these services for CIP projects, our section also provides code compliance and enforcement services through the same to the Nevada System of Higher Education and other separately funded state agencies for their construction projects. For this current biennium and to this point in time, our client services have included 127 capital improvement program projects, 344 agency, or as we call them, B building projects, for a combined total of 471 construction projects statewide. Our largest recent projects include the University of Nevada at Las Vegas Advanced Engineering Building, which you saw pictures of earlier, the University of Nevada Reno Gateway Parking Garage, which was recently completed, and the University of Nevada Las Vegas Tropicana Garage Extension, which would be a great boon to that area. Our office provides code and design consulting services to our professional services section, to external agencies, and to design professionals, design build, and CMAR contractors. Now I will turn it back to Administrator Lefebvre for closing remarks. Thank you. Kent Lefebvre for the record. Thank you for your attention and interest in this important part of state government. We'd be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, that was my cue. <laughs> um, all right, at this time, I'll invite any members, any questions? Assemblywoman Thomas and then Assemblywoman Taylor. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I just want to say that this was a fantastic overview of 
what I'm seeing that um, public works, because you know, so many times we take for granted, and uh, I do appreciate you um, going through everything that that um, your department actually does. I do have a question about um, slide nine, and it's just because I am uh, an avid uh, admirer of anyone that takes a hold of pre-kindergarten. And I was just wondering, do you know how many uh, kiddos are being served at this fantastic facility? Kent Lefebvre for the record. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's in the 30 range. There's two classrooms uh, set up for, for preschoolers, and uh, it's really a fabulous facility, including a uh, enclosed playground area and other program areas. Great, a follow-up to your please. Um, thank you, and hopefully I can, when I'm back in the south, in the warmness of Nevada, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping to um, make a tour of that facility. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Someone Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Lefevre, for the, the presentation. You and your staff, I mean, these, these pictures are fantastic. I mean, these buildings look amazing. So thank you for sharing those with us. My question comes from a slide number 14, and you mentioned um, three um, project delivery methods. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with each of the three of them, but I'm wondering if, if, if one is preferable to another when it comes down to um, your, 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 your department, your division standpoint, if, if one's more favorable you know, to, to the public or anything like that. One, one, is one better, one more fantastic, one less desirable, what? Kent Lefebvre for the record. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Taylor. The uh, three delivery methods really are great tools in their own right. And it depends on really the project, the needs of the project, that, uh, that we make a decision on which one to use. For example, uh, hard bid or the, the design bid build option is uh, a, a low bid environment. So, that, uh, that project or those kinds of projects have their place and we do a ton of low bid projects in our office. Um, they don't get a lot of attention but because they come in, they get designed, they get built and they get, you know, we move on. But um, the design is performed and completed before they go out to bid and they are advertised publicly uh, State Public Works has a qualified list of contractors that uh, may bid on these projects, and then they're, low, they're awarded to the lowest responsive bidder. The design build option is one that we use less, but uh, nevertheless it is still allowed in statute, and that is where the contractor is hired to basically run the construction including the design professionals they work they work for the contractor and that is a good application if you're in a hurry to get something done um, there are there are some challenges with design build and usually quality is one of those things that suffer with design build but um, however it is a way to deliver the building and the third one is CMAR or construction manager at risk. And there's quite a bit of uh, attention given to that because these are the bigger projects that we deal with. And what's great about this delivery method is that you get the architect and the engineer and the contractor in the same room at the start of a project. And so you get the synergy of, of all that uh, knowledge and experience bringing to bear on a project early on. And so we've had really good success with CMAR projects. They're always within budget, which is just fantastic. And, and the problems that you run into during the, the field, we have contingencies for those so that we can manage them rather than have them manage us. So. Okay. 
I hope that answered your question. It does. That was fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Lefebvre. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblyman Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've actually experienced uh, the issue of quality control with your design build, I'm thinking specifically of the uh, elevators at the Bryant Building. So, but my question actually has to do with uh, slide 17. Um, on it, you have recommended repairs of just under $570 million. Um, are those uh, two, two parts of the question? Are those for the 24 25 biennium? And were they all included in the governor's recommended budget? Kent Lefevre, for the record, thank you for the question. The $569 million is a, is a rolled up total of three different priorities we have for. Um, repairs first priority is it's got to be done in the next two years and then the second priority is it should be done in the next two to five year window and the third priority is it should be done in the next five to ten years depends on what it needs um, and that's a judgment call that's made by our staff uh, in consultation with the facility managers and buildings and grounds so to your other question is, is this all recommended in the Governor's uh, budget, no. What we have recommended in the governor's budget is the top priorities for maintenance, which includes some, somewhere north of, what, $211 million in this biennium. And that's pretty consistent with what we've done in the past. Actually, it's a little more aggressive, but uh, last session we had 100 and, you remember? About 170 million in uh, maintenance, and the session before that it was in the 150s. So the other thing I'd like to say about deferred maintenance is that we're getting ahead of it. You know, after 10 years of recession and and everything just sitting there, getting older and breaking, we've been able to um, combat that curve of maintenance so that we are getting ahead of it now. So within the next two sessions or so, we're gonna be down to a normal maintenance uh, schedule for a deferred maintenance rather, rather than this kind of big bubble that, we're go that we've got right now. Thank you, that's really good to hear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblyman De Silva and then Assemblyman Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. You've been doing a fantastic job of uh, moderating this uh, committee hearing this morning, and thank you again, uh, Director uh, Lefebvre, for your fantastic presentation. <coughs> I have a, uh, two quick questions. So uh, in, in regards to uh, state departments, divisions, agencies, uh, across the board, uh, you know, there's been a, you know, conversations about staffing issues. Uh, my question was this, one, uh, what's, what are the total employees that work uh, for this uh, department? And uh, number two, are there any uh, staffing uh, concerns uh, uh, at this moment? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Give me just a sec. I got to put my glasses on. Kent Lefevre, for the record, we have 134 total employees at the division. And how many vacancies? Is that the question? Yes. How many vacancies? It's about 20%. Yeah, we're running about 20% vacancies. Just a quick follow-up, Madam Chair. Is so so that, that so there is a uh, one out of five of the uh, positions that are missing, and is this this is not normal? I'm I'm, I'm assuming. Thank you. Well, it's pretty normal. Can't look fever for the record. This it's pretty normal for the state of the state we're in right now. Every every department, not just ours, is is experiencing significant vacancies. So what do we do about that? You might ask. Um, we're doing everything we can uh, to recruit new staff, to attract new staff, to, um, to advertise our positions. And last year, I'm happy to report that we filled um, six project manager positions that were, that were vacant during COVID. So we're gaining on it, but we're not there yet. Thank you, sir. I think it was important to get that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Cecilia Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Good morning and thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if it was possible that we could get a list 
of all the um, land that you've sold to developers for the purposes of public buildings. Kent Lefevre for the record. That list would be, be very small. And I think uh, the agency that you should maybe direct that question to is state lands. We do not buy and sell state land, we manage it. And I'm not aware of any state land that's been sold in the recent past. Thank you, Solomon Carter. Yes, sir. Um, going back to slide 14, you show three different models for developing projects. There's a fourth one that's being used by lower level entities, counties, um, police departments and the like, um, arguably to circumvent state law, and that's the lease buyback model. Is, this, is your agency engaging in that lease buyback scam? Kent Lefevre for the record. Uh, NRS allows a public-private partnership for transportation facilities only. Uh, the division does not participate in P3 uh, ventures because our law does not allow it. When you engage in those public-private partnerships, is prevailing wage required on those projects and enforced? Kent Lefevre, for the record, again, I couldn't comment on that because we don't do P3s at Public Works. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Seeing no additional questions, uh, thank you so much for taking your time today. You did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. And at this time, we will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 8, which revises the composition of the Metropolitan Police Committee on Fiscal Affairs. Um, and I know that uh, Ms. Joanna Jacob has been working on this. Um, a committee members, I will remind you that there was an amendment, amendment submitted that has been added to Nellis. Thank you. Good morning to you, Chair Torres, Vice Chair Duran, and members of the committee. Um, thank you for referencing our amendment, Chair Torres. What I'd like to do today is work from that amendment, which is intended to replace um, the original language So, um, in the bill. So as I present this bill and our reasons for um, seeking this bill on behalf of Clark County, I will refer to the amendment um, because that is our intent. Um, my name is Joanna Jacob, and I serve as the Government Affairs Manager for Clark County. Um, this bill before you, Assembly Bill 8, revises the composition of the Metropolitan Police Committee on Fiscal Affairs. Though it does not reference specifically Clark County, um, and it's, it's really written in global terms, um, Metro, this has been this type of committee has been in statute for quite some time. Um, it was passed in the 1970s, actually, when there was some effort to create um, this type of collaboration that we have the authority in our state to merge police functions. The only place where that has happened, to my knowledge, is in Clark County, where Las Vegas and, the, and Clark County share in the responsibility for the operating budget over Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Authority. So the Metro, this bill is, when we're talking about revision to the Fiscal Affairs Committee, I wanna talk a little bit about what this bill, the committee oversees. It provides the oversight and approval of uh, Metro Police's budget. We, Metro is funded. I know you heard this in the presentation when our county manager and CFO came to visit with you at the beginning of the session. We talked about that the funding for Metro is split um, based on a formula that considers such factors as population of our respective agencies, the calls for service in, um, in both the city and the county, and felony crimes. Historically, Clark County has contributed the largest proportion of the funding overall for the budget. 
As part of that fiscal oversight, the committee approves contracts and collective bargaining agreements, and then they approve proposed budgets that are in turn sent back to both the city of Las Vegas and to the county, and they approve settlement agreements in the case of litigation against Metro. Those staffing costs um, for patrol functions and investigative functions for Metro are apportioned between the city and county. The committee also approves collective bargaining agreements for the detention center. Clark County Detention Center is a regional service funded entirely by the county. We typically house over 3,000 inmates there average um, per day. The tension, I guess, that we see is that the county also carries insurance coverage. Any settlement agreement hits this policy, which covers the agency as a whole. Our um, cost of any settlement is then charged back to Metro, who has risk liability pools for this purpose. One is for patrol functions, and one is isolated for detention. These pools are covered in part then by the operating budget, which is then set between the funding apportionment between the city and the county. But it's a critical note for us is that the county's insurance policy is the backstop. Um, the settlements hit our coverage policy impacting our rates, and these settlements, by contrast, we do not believe hit the city of Las Vegas's policy. So what is our proportionate share, and how has this grown? For fiscal year 2023, county's share of Metro's operating budget, subject to the agency contribution formula in the statute, was $297.9 million, or 66% of that overall, uh, that or, or overall formula. Las Vegas's share of the budget was $153 million, or 34%. So we are largely at two-thirds to one-third ratio. And through the years, our share of this budget has only increased. Over the last 12 years, from fiscal year 12 to fiscal year 23, we, the budget has grown 30, for city of Las Vegas, has grown by 30%, while our share has grown 50, 57% in total dollar amounts over this time span. And this is the reason that we are seeking the change to in AB 8. Currently, in current law, and now I will kind of refer you to the amendment, um, the current makeup of this committee is two members from the county, two members from the city, and one public member. The change that we're seeking in this bill is to add a county representative so that it more accurately reflects the proportion that we put in. Um, the city's representation is not impacted, so the, under the makeup of our amendment as proposed, we intend to have a makeup of three county members, two city of Las Vegas members, and then two public members. In the original draft, we actually had proposed, and this was really an attempt to avoid a tie vote. This committee is actually a business committee, so we can't have a tie vote. It has to operate because it's approving contracts and settlement agreements, and we originally had said for the public member that we were going to make them a non-voting member that was caused some concern in the community we agreed it's not the best way to approach this problem so we have worked with some of the community stakeholders and I will note here that Metro Chamber was one of the ones with whom we worked they will come up opposed today um, but the concern was really about removal of the vote of the public member with the amendment and the addition of the additional public member and restoring the voting status of the public members, I believe that that opposition has been addressed. So if passed, so really that's the effect of our amendment is that we would like an additional county seat, um, two public members, two city of Las Vegas members, all of whom will vote. If passed, the bill is effective July 1st, 2023, and that's it in a nutshell. I would like to just say a few things, what this bill is not about. There has been this is not about a history of disagreement between the city of Las Vegas or Clark County. By large, the committee does have a consensus. This is not about criticizing the city of Las Vegas or the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Um, we value our partnership with both. The goal is really simple, that the makeup reflect what we put in um, and the contributions that are growing by Clark County. By adding another public member, we're attempting a fair um, makeup of this committee. It has been pointed out to me by some committee members when we were talking about this bill that you might still have a result where you could end up with a 4-3 vote against the county and uh, you know that 
is a fair result, we think, because it avoids a concern that may be out there that Clark County is attempting to stack this committee. That was pointed out to me in discussion, and that's a fair point, um, that we might end up with a 4-3 vote. Um, what this bill is about is ensuring Clark County, who is responsible for both regional and then municipal services for over one million residents. And for those municipal services, that's one million residents who get services by both Clark County um, for both our regional services and then city services because they don't live in a city. And those services are impacting our general fund. Our public safety um, budget, as we, we said this in our presentation to the committee, makes up a fair share of our overall general fund expenditure. This is about responsibility over that general fund, about getting our arms around our growing responsibility under the formula, and really keeping an eye on what the general fund obligation, and more importantly, the risk is to Clark County. Um, I think that's is really very simply about proportionate representation for us. I know you will have opposition today from Metro um, and from the city of Las Vegas. We are having conversations with them. We're open to additional conversations, but those conversations must reflect the growing contribution that we make and, um, and our liability concerns. So with that, Chair Torres, I will stand for questions. Thank you. Members, any questions? Assemblyman Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Um, so, Cecilia Gonzalez, Assembly District 16, for the record, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, apologies, I'm not too familiar with the board, so I was just curious if you could go into more details about, um, you mentioned approving contracts and things like that, so I was just curious, what are more of the everyday things that this board um, does and the decisions that they make? Thank you. Sure, I'm happy to do that, Assemblyman Gonzalez, um, through you, <laughs> Chair Torres, to the Assemblywoman Joanna Jacob, for the record. Please feel free to go directly to the Thank member. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also know that Metro will come up so they can also talk a little bit more about the meat and potatoes of that committee. But largely, it's the business committee that oversees the fiscal affairs of the department. So we're approving such things as the collective bargaining agreements, doing the budget, acceptance of gifts and grants, um, these types of things that really go to the operating budget of Las Vegas Metro. Um, and recently, we have been approving also settlement agreements um, that have been resulted from litigation of to against the department. Um, so that's really, uh, you know, it's it is. An an open meeting, I would like to say, subject to open meeting law, the agendas are can be found on Las Vegas Metro's um, website. If you Google, if you were to search for the Fiscal Affairs um, Committee, they are publicly um, posted on their website, and you can take a look at those types of agendas and the types of agreements that are approved. Thank you. Feel free to follow up. Thank you. I have a follow up. So I just wanted to confirm. Um, you stated that this board was originally created in 1970, right? Thank you, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Um, Joanna Jacob, for the record, in, in the 70s, I think it was, in, I, from my notes, it, it, was the, it was a long time ago, SB 340 in 1973 approved legislation that uh, enabled this, this merging of the, and that's really the history of the merging. So uh, just to clarify my comment, that's where we started looking at the merging of those services for Metropolitan Police and the possibility for, um, for that merging. Thank you, and I just wanted to clarify on the record again. So this, this makeup hasn't changed in decades, and so this bill is seeking to address the population growth in the county as well as what the county is pouring into the budget. Thank you, Joanna Jacob, for the record. Thank you, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. I, I'd have to look back in, at the statutory history on decades, um, but it, since created, yes, it has not changed. And what has changed is our is our population growth in our community um, for Clark County, and really that's impacting um, our proportionate share of the way that the funding formula works. And so that has changed, and it is continuing to change. I think th just this week. Um, 
at yesterday, today is Wednesday, yesterday my Board of County Commissioners met and this funding apportionment actually went as a consent item on our Clark County Board of Commissioners agenda. And so that was it, where we are is 66% on average um, proportionate contribution to the budget for the next fiscal year. We are currently creating that budget, but this is where we have been historically, we have been exceeding about 60%, but then we, it's increased in the last years, and that's why we're seeking the change now. Thank you. Members, I know there were a couple others with additional questions. Assemblyman Carter and then Assemblyman De Silva. Thank you. Yes. Um, do you happen to know the current proportional population rate between the city of Las Vegas and the unincorporated part of the county that most people think is the city of Las Vegas but really isn't? Thank you, Assemblyman Carter. Joanna Jacob, for the record. I actually don't know if I have the full population estimates, and your point is well taken. A lot of, um, that's one of the things that we struggle with sometimes in the county um, for our residents is to know where they live. I do, I can tell you, we are up to a, a one million residents in our unincorporated areas, and we know, I think I had a note, I'll try and find my note about the comparative population growth. I did have a note in my notes that the city, when we looked at census data, and I know the city is coming up to, um, to testify, so I apologize. When we looked, it was proportionate since the 70s, about our whole area has grown for about 400% in city of Las Vegas, but then we've seen over 700% in our unincorporated areas. Because when you look at the unincorporated areas of Clark County, that is where, where there's land and where there can be growth. And we are in particularly, we are growing particularly in our Southwest. Um, we've had rapid growth in that area. Assemblyman De Silva. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again uh, for your uh, great presentation today. <coughs> uh, so just, just to clarify, so this, this bill is going to be looking at, in regards to the proportionality aspect, uh, three things, correct? Uh, insurance liability issues, uh, it's looking at uh, issues pertaining to population, and then also uh, the budget and its proportionality, correct? And then uh, s my second question is this, that the non-voting member that is going to be a part of this uh, board, can you describe what their role is going to be and, and uh, why they're significant to this uh, composition? Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman De Silva, Joanna Jacob, for the record. So just to clarify, the, the things that you stated, the population growth, um, insurance coverage, and those are our reasons for seeking this change. Um, that committee, because those are the, the issues that are addressed in the Fiscal Affairs Committee. Um, and thank you for the question about the non-voting member. That was actually a change that we proposed in the original language of the bill. I think you're referring to the public member. The public member is actually we think an important role for Metro Fiscal Affairs oversight is it ensures because ultimately we're responsible to the residents that we represent and that we serve, that you serve also as an elected official. So that the role there um, is that we historically have had a public member who also um, sits on that committee, and that's an important oversight role that we see, which is why we restored the voting um, status of that public member, and we added an additional public member in our amendment, and that is really so that we have an odd number of committee members, and so we avoid um, inaction through tie vote. So that's, I hope that addresses your question. Please let me know if I did not. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for this fantastic overview of this bill. But I have, I'm, I'm a little bit confused here um, because I'm hearing population and I'm hearing fiscal, you know, money. And what I'm understanding, um, or I want to understand, is that Clark County is, um, uh, the greater contributor as far as funds to um, the Metro budget and that Metro does not um, equal the same budget. So therefore, um, the county would like to have uh, an additional seat on this committee in order to 
um, in order to make it so that since they are the bigger contributor, have more seats or the bigger, bigger say on this committee? And that's just one question, but I have a, a, a question. Uh, if you can just tell the makeup of the original um, committee, and then that way I understand what you're actually asking for right now. Assemblywoman Thomas, thank you. Joanna Jacob for the record. So, okay, let me take a stab at this. So I'll start with the original makeup. The current makeup is two county representatives, two city representatives, so equal between the county and the city, and one public member. So let's start there. Um, and then I think what your question was, uh, when you mentioned the, uh, you acknowledged yes, and the reason we're asking for this change uh, to reflect the proportionate contribution by Clark County is because yes, we are a larger contributor. Historically, we have been. It has really become to a threshold of where we are contributing two thirds of the cost. And so this was a, a concept and the issue of proportionate representation by Clark County for the things that we fund in our community has become of increasing importance to our Board of County Commissioners as we continue to take on the responsibility for providing these services for our growing community. So that is the reason why you had made a statement about the it's not equal or that we're trying to have a larger say. I, I That's not really the intent, um, as I noted, that by adding, we've tried to keep a balanced approach because by adding an additional public member, for example, it does not mean that Clark County is automatically gonna come in and sway the vote at all times. I think that's a very important distinction. This, and I also will just again repeat, this is a working committee by large, there is consensus on this committee. It is a partnership between the city of Las Vegas and Metro and the Clark County. And so it's not about having a larger say, but more importantly, is that we serve a responsibility to the people that we serve um, because we are responsible for two thirds of the cost and that is where we are. And that is where what we are trying to do is to reflect that proportionate contribution um, more accurately in the composition of the committee. I hope that that addresses your question. So again, let me just, I'll add one more time with the amendment, we're just asking for one additional county representative and then we're balancing that by appointing an additional public member. Thank great, you. Great explanation and uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. For, thank you for the presentation. That was fantastic. Um, I have a question that, if allowable, may, may go into a, a, a second question. Um, so the, the, you're okay with the proportionality from a funding standpoint because that's where the numbers go. The issue is not the fiscal formula. I see you're nodding, so I'm going to just kind of roll with this if you'll let me, Madam Chair. Um, so what kind, what kind of numbers, are, I'm very curious, what kind of numbers are we talking about from the budgetary stand? How much is this? Thank you, Assemblywoman Taylor. Um, Joanna Jacob, for the record, I, I think I did say for last year, for example, the total number, um, how much we are facing. And, I, and I'm sorry, I don't have before me, for example, the costs of the settlements that we have approved through this committee. So this is separate, but I'll give you my global statement again for the record that for fiscal year 23, how much did we contribute? It was $297.9 million. And this was part of where we looked at it. And we said, we're contributing 279 million, the Las Vegas share of this operating budget. And when I'm talk talking about, this isn't Metro's overall budget because Metro has additional sources of revenue that come in, but this is, we're talking about the collaborate, the proportion that we fund between our agencies, the county and city. So when we looked at that contribution and what we, and that is set by the formula, like we, w with the operation of the formula, and yes, I will correct and state for the record, we are not seeking to change this formula in this bill. This is because we represent a larger amount of citizens in, in as the county with 2.3 million residents for our 
regional services, one million in our municipal areas. And so this is really, um, so when we looked at it, again, so we were looking at 297 million in fiscal year 23. And then the city's contribution was 153 million. So that's the proportionate share of what this county's putting in and the city's putting in. We're doing our budget right now. So, and th that budget will be, um, well, at least we'll have our tentative budget by May and we believe it'll probably be along those same ratios again, um, based on the application of the formula again, which we are not addressing in this bill. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblyman Nguyen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think it's fantastic that you're adding back the vote to the public, which is really um, something that we should never forget, um, is that our, our state and our county is still a uh, you know, citizen-involved uh, government, so we want to make sure that we don't lose that voice. Um, my concern with the appointment of those two public members um, right now, the curtain statute reads that the members of the committee shall, by majority vote, select two additional members. Um, that uh, just kind of created a new question in my head, is that if uh, the committee self-select, and now that if we approve this, Clark will have a bigger voice in selecting that. Um, were there thoughts about making sure that one member of the public come from the city and one member of the public come from the county, just to ensure that um, all of a sudden, if, if the county has a majority vote in that selection of five member, three county, two city, that they can select, um, at the end of the day, two member that just representing county interests and therefore tip the scale by having five against two. So just want to ask that. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Wynn, and um, Joanna Jacob for the record. So I want to talk about, so thank you for your question and your concern. I want to talk about the selection um, process, and I guess I would say this isn't the county having a larger share in who the selection is. The current way that that's done is it's actually, and really this we think that this works well, and this is another important way that we would balance, is that the county submits a list nominations three members, the city also, um, some, they get to select three members, and then the sheriff submits three members. And then from that pool, which so it's not that the county would be able to select more or less, that we all have equal right, and it's a mutual um, decision by majority vote of that committee. I, um, I'm open to conversations about that. I, you know, this is where you're going to see opposition. I think I would have to discuss this though with the, the uh, with the stakeholders um, on that concept because I do believe that that process works well and it allows also for balance so that the county's not saying we're going to we're going to come in and appoint the public member so that there's equal say in the nomination process by all three parties involved and that's where we are we believe that process works well but of course um, if there's a request from one of the stakeholders then we are open we're open to that conversation but I will say I do think that process works well and in my conversation with Metro um, on this bill, uh, you know, this is where we have said that we think that process could could stay in place, and we think it is an important balance to maintain. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Any additional questions? All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. At this time, we will go ahead and invite any testimony in support of AB8 up here in Carson City. In support. In Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in support of AB8 over the phone? To testify in support of AB8, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Again, that is press star 9. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in support at this time. Thank you. And at this time, I'll invite anyone wishing to testify in opposition to AB8 up here in Carson City. 
And just a reminder for those testifying, please make sure that you state your name for the record. I will ask if Metro wants to go ahead and go first. I'll give you some additional time um, to just finish out whatever remarks that you have. If you want to go ahead and take five minutes, um, if you need it, use whatever time. The members might have some additional questions, um, and then I'll go to everybody else. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Torres. Uh, Beth Schmidt, for the record, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We oppose this bill but we continue to work with the sponsor and we have maintained, we're maintaining an open dialogue both here up in Carson City and back in Las Vegas. And we are hopeful that we, we will come to a consensus. I wanna point out that historically, so since 1973, this has been in effect, the Fiscal Affairs Committee has functioned very well and it continues to do so. We are hard pressed to find a vote that has not been five to zero. I think that's a really important point, that this group is in agreement when it comes to the fiscal affairs of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We are a consolidated police department, and we work best when both the city and the county have equal say in the finances, as the budget is equally large proportionally for each entity. We are run by an elected official who has incentive to ensure that both the city and the county are treated fairly. We see no problem right now that this bill fixes. And our concern is that change for no reason could bring instability to a structure that has supported arguably one of the most effective regional government arrangements in the state since 1973. I want to talk about the citizen member. The citizen member, and it has always been a two to one, so it's been one citizen member. That member has always acted as a bridge between the two government agencies. And in our experience, they have shown, they have never shown favoritism to the city or the county. We, at this point, we see this bill as a solution in search of a future problem. Thank you, Officer Schmidt. And members, are there any questions for Officer Schmidt just about the this board? Obviously, it's not their bill, but if there's any questions regarding Clark. Okay, some of them, Taylor, and then some of them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Officer Schmidt. Thank you for being here. Question, um, it does seem from all accounts that the, the, the committee has certainly worked well. Um, in the past. My question would be, um, do you have a response to the fiscal concerns on behalf of the county? Beth Schmidt, for the record, the concern that this, that which concern, that they're paying, they feel that it's, um, they're paying two-thirds? Yes. Okay. I, again, we feel that that the city and the county historically, it has worked for them to have equal say because proportionally those numbers are still proportionally very large and significant for each of the two agencies and I will allow the city to speak. We've heard the county, I would allow the city to speak on that as well. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, they're next and they know what's coming. Uh, Assemblyman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, Metro um, representing I, I just, my concern right now is when you gave the stat of 1973, this is 2023. So with that said, we have changed. We had a smaller population, a smaller budget, and smaller responsibilities in, back in 1973. So with that said, now the county has um, actually more responsibility, more citizens. So could we not agree that with that responsibility, um, you know, comes more, um, I guess, responsibilities um, for our citizens? And, um, you know, I know that you said that you were working with the uh, county and city. Um, and I'm hoping that you continue to do that because it has to be a consensus that things have changed, things are different. 
and we need more, um, you know, especially with our population growth. We really do need more uh, services and that fiscal budget that uh, we're looking at right now, uh, even though this is a policy committee, I think that that should be taken in consideration. Beth Schmidt, for the record, thank you very much for your thoughtful question. There's no question population has grown, but I think we also need to hear from the city because the city has also grown in those, in those five decades. The greatest concern we have is that right now the votes, they, they have been historically 5-0. This is a board that works, and they're not looking at policy, they're looking at fiscal. And it does work, and our concern is that a change of this, where there, there is no problem right now, the concern is that this could bring instability to what has been an incredibly effective board. That is our concern by making change for the sake of change. That is, that is the concern that, that we have. Thank you. And, and one final question. I'll remind the, the committee members, obviously, that this is not a bill from the Las Vegas Metro Police Department. Uh, Assemblyman Gonzalez. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. Thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify, because um, in your statement, you said that um, it's a solution to a future problem. Um, and then just right now, you said it's not a problem right now. So I'm just curious in all of your conversations, is this something, if we don't talk or get through right now, that we will continue to see, continue to have conversations? Do you see it to be a problem in the future? I just wanted clarity on that. Thank you so much. Beth Schmidt, for the record, we don't see a problem in the future, but that, that's how it has been presented to us, that there could be things that come in the future. There, there always could be things, but the ship is even. The ship has been even for decades, and there's always a lot of what-ifs in the world, and our concern is if we, if we change this on the what-ifs is do we, do we tilt this, this ship that has sailed very successfully and very smoothly? You're welcome. Thank you. And members, if we have any additional questions, I encourage you to reach out to Officer Schmidt so we can continue these conversations offline. I will remind the committee that we do have one other bill presentation. I know we have quite a bit of testimony um, in, for this bill as well as the following bill. Um, go ahead, Ms. Crompton. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Kelly Crompton, representing the city of Las Vegas. Um, to not repeat, I think we agree with a lot of the concerns that have brought up, been brought up by the Metropolitan Police Department. I will just add that um, we did a lot of uh, research on our own, um, share similar concerns. This board is, um, has membership made up of two elected members from the county, two elected members from the city. Um, so people that have been entrusted from the voters to represent both organizations. Um, we have, um, gone back and looked at the history and, and like Officer Schmidt said, um, the, the, the votes on this committee, they are historically 5-0 votes. There's not conflict, um, there's not a need right now um, to change the makeup of this committee. Um, we also looked at the population from back in uh, 1973 when this was created and the proportion of population was, well, significantly smaller, um, a 60-40 split around that, around that area. Um, so as you see population growth in the county, you're also seeing population growth in the city um, and the proportionate funds that we put into the, the Metro's budget um, have also risen as our populations have grown. I will say that um, we continue to see population growth in both areas. Um, the city is landlocked, so we are looking at pop population growth in the urban core going upwards. You'll see a bill from us later in the session um, addressing some of those um, areas. And, and so we are looking at a different dynamic of um, population within the city core that I think um, will continue to be um, an important um, stake for the city to have equal representation on this board as you see that population growth. We are one of the largest cities in the country. Um, when, you're, when we're talking about federal appropriations, um, we're looking at cities like Los Angeles, Philadelphia, New Orleans, big cities with big city problems. And so I think it is fair and right that the city of Las Vegas continue to have its proportionate share. Thank you, and I believe we have a couple questions if that's all right. Thank you, Assemblyman DeLong. Thank you, Madam Chair. You said 60-40. Is that county-city or city-county? 
Thank you for the question, Assemblyman. Uh, for the record, Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas. Um, that's county city, so kind of the same makeup we see currently. Thank you. I, I believe that's all. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Paul Moratkin with the Vegas Chamber. Um, the Chamber is opposed to the bill as drafted. Our organization's policy is we oppose the bill till the amendment is adopted by the committee or by the body. Um, as you've heard, this committee structure has been in place for many years, but from the Chamber perspective, that voting seat is important. I appreciate the comment that was made by Selman Nguyen, is that that seat has historically been held by either representative of the business community, taxpayer community, or our tourism community because it's a fiscal committee, right? It oversees financial affairs for the, for the, Met, for the Metro um, Police Department. The Chamber has 10 of these meetings over the years. It is a very straightforward committee in terms of financial oversight. Um, so it has been very co cohesive in its approach over the years. Um, the Chamber was opposed as when this bill first came out. I do want to thank Clark County for working through us, trying to address our concerns. We do view the board as uh, highly effective in its current composition, but to the points that were made in committee, a removal of a public sector seat for the community is always a concern, and that's where our, our opposition came from. So happy to address any concerns for the committee, but thank you for your time, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good morning, Madam Chair. Brian Wachter, the Senior Vice President of the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we appreciate uh, the work of the Las Vegas Chamber. Uh, we won't repeat any of the testimony. We also appreciate the county adding those two public, or adding the public seat back in, um, and as well as adding an additional one. Our concern uh, when it comes to the fiscal side is when you start having conversations about revenue and taxation um, with constituents, having the legitimacy of public members uh, who are there to provide uh, reasons and context uh, for sometimes when uh, those revenue questions come before uh, both the commission uh, as well as the legislature. Things like more cops, uh, are we spending our money appropriately? All of that is legitimized when you have more uh, public members. And so we appreciate the new direction of the bill and we look forward to being in support. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in opposition here in Carson City? In Las Vegas, is there anyone wishing to testify in opposition to AB8? BPS, is there anyone on the phone wishing to testify in opposition to AB8? To testify in opposition of AB8, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Again, that is star 9. Chair, we have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ms. Jacobs up for any closing remarks. I apologize. Thank you. Um, at, at this time, I, I just need to see if there's anybody wishing to testify neutral to AB8 here in Carson City or in Las Vegas. BBS, is there anyone on the phone wishing to testify neutral to AB8? To testify in neutral for AB8, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Here we have no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. When you're ready, any closing remarks? Thank you, Chair Torres. Joanna Jacob, for the record, I would like to make a few closing remarks. We are open to dialogue with the city and with Metro. I guess I would just like to say, in response to some of the comments, I disagree that adding in another representative of the county would lead to instability. I do not think that that is something that we are seeking. And we, I was very clear in my testimony that we have tried to take a balanced approach um, and also balance that with the appointment of another public member. I appreciate the comments of Mr. Walker about the importance of transparency and how these dollars are spent and the importance of that public member because this is really what we are also trying to address. We have a responsibility to our residents for this budget. And I guess in response to the concerns of the city of Las Vegas, and I do have a great deal of respect for them, they are a partner 
um, of ours in a number of matters, and I respect the comments that they made. They made a reference about being the largest city. I would like to just say, and I feel it's my responsibility as Clark County's representative, to say that if Clark County's unincorporated area was a city, we would be larger than the city of Las Vegas. So that is why we feel a responsibility to, our, to the citizens that we represent to oversee our budgets, and the truth of the matter is that our, our responsibility is growing. The reason and the difference between the county and the city, just for the record, is that the county holds the liability policy. We are the backstop that does not impact the city of Las Vegas. And this is a growing concern nationally about insurance coverage for public safety functions. This is something that is a real concern that will be addressed before this committee. And I would like to say I am very open in to discussion about this, but I really strongly um, oppose any premise that proportionate representation would lead to instability in this committee, which I did acknowledge in my testimony has worked very well. This is not about disagreement or split votes. It's about proportionate representation. That is important for the Clark County, and that I would like to close with that comment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jacobs, and I look forward to continuing to work together and bringing together the stakeholders on AB8. At this time, we will close the hearing on AB8, and we will open the hearing on AB79, which revises provisions governing the temporary limited appointment of persons with disabilities by certain state agencies. And we invite a former member of this great committee, Assemblyman Tracy Brownmay. When you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, esteemed members of this committee. I am so pleased and honored to sit here before you today. I've never had the opportunity to testify in front of the hardest working committee on government affairs. And it's a great feeling. Congratulations. It's Thank fantastic. You. <laughs> uh, Assembly Bill 79 is a short bill which I'm sure you will all appreciate. Um, for the record, my name is Tracy Brown May. I am the Assemblywoman representing Assembly District 42 in Clark County. I have spent 22 years of my career in disability support services with the goal of improving the lives and outcomes and integration of all people with disabilities in our community. Um, I'm excited to be here in front of you today. We're going to talk about the 700-hour program. I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Um, there is, I believe, a short video that was supplied by the division available in some of your materials, which is a video shared internally within the state of Nevada as part of the Human Resources Department's access to the 700-hour program. The 700-hour program is a way for the state to uh, consider employment opportunities for people with disabilities for a period of 700 hours. Um, having successfully had the opportunity to complete a 700-hour program, many times people who are perceived to have barriers in employment, we find that is not in fact the truth. And given the opportunity to try a job out, then have a successful employment outcome later. So this is a provision that's existed in Nevada Revised Statutes since 1965. You can go back and look at the original documentation if you click that link on our Nellis and on our NRS digests, um, which I thought was very interesting. Now, here today, it's important that you know that we have uh, the division administrator for uh, re the rehabilitation division, Drazen Ellis, who's in our Las Vegas office. And we have our deputy administrator for the division, Michelle Merrill, who is here in this room with us today to be able to answer and address some of the specific questions we may have with regard to the application of the 700-hour program. Uh, the hires totaled since 2018 through this program total 246 people with a successful long-term placement totaling 129 people. That's 129 people with disabilities that came through our Division of Vocational Rehabilitation seeking additional services that are now State of Nevada employees and working in multiple divisions, which is the successful outcome that we would like to achieve for, for all people with disabilities. Some of the agency barriers um, that we have identified and the reason that this bill is necessary is because of the way the language is written, and we'll walk through that in a minute. 
There's a list of people who have been certified by the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation as qualifying for a specific position. The way that the bill currently, the way that the NRS currently exists, the division who is looking to fill a specific position, if there are individuals on that list that qualify, they have to go through each one of those positions. So let's say you're looking for an administrative position, there are three people with disabilities that are qualified and on that list and you're hiring in your division of public safety. You bring a person in for 700 hours, that person doesn't work out, the way the current law is, you have to then go through the other two people on the list. So there's a barrier and state divisions were then just not filling positions. So it's believed that with this small revision in our bill and that I'll walk through in just a minute, that we encourage additional access to people with disabilities, encouraging our divisions to try people in positions that they've been certified to fill. Now it's important to understand that it's, you can't just walk off the street. You come through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and are certified as qualified to fill this position. And then the division hires you for a period of 700 hours, you walk through that. If you're successful and you receive placement, then the time that you've done is counted toward your state employment. So really the goal here is about improving employment outcomes for people with disabilities in the state of Nevada. So let's walk through the bill. If you look at section one, at the very top of page two, you will see on line three that it says, the appointing authority shall, if possible, make, and you'll notice that A is stricken out and it's in changed instead to at least one. So we're trying to determine to direct the divisions, the, the appointing authorities, to try at least one temporary limited appointment of a person that's been certified with a disability that's available for the position. Just at least one, that's what we're asking for, at least one person with a disability to be attempted in a 700 hour opportunity in the state's division. The rest of the bill remains the same. And then we jump to page three in section C, it says that if the appointing authority has, if possible, made at least one temporary limited appointment pursuant to that subsection one, to a person, um, a person without a disability who has been applied by the administrator and uh, possesses the training and skills necessary for the position can then be hired. So what we're saying here is that as long as you try at least one person with a disability for a period of 700 hours, try it, fill your position. If you determine that that's not a good fit and you have other candidates that you'd like to try that don't have disabilities, you don't have to stay in that existing list of seven, eight, three, five people that have been certified by the Division of Administration, Rehabilitation Division, that you can actually hire your position. So what we're trying to do is eliminate the barrier that the state departments perceive as not wanting to fill those positions at all. We just want them to try it with a person with a disability at least one time, and then they can hire their positions. That's the bill. And everything that we're trying to accomplish. So I, I'm happy to take your questions, and uh, if it pleases the chair, I'd like to invite the administrator to the table as well as our deputy administrator to answer questions. Thank you, members, any questions? Uh, I'm gonna go to Assemblyman DeLong and then Vice Chair Duran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, back to section one, just to try and get a little more clarity and get a little more granular on the change from A to at least one. Are you saying that because the word A was in there, it's perceived that you could only do one person in that 700 hour program and you're now putting in at least one to imply that it could be more? Thank you, Assemblyman. Tracy Brown May for the record. I, I think it's actually the opposite. The way that it's written currently says that A and then we have to go down the list. And so by saying at least one, we're delineating that one is our attempt. Please give us one opportunity. Um, and I'm happy to defer to the Deputy Administrator if she'd like to add more. Michelle Merrill for the record. Um, thank you for the question. I think that that is, Assemblywoman's explanation is accurate. We just want to make sure that people get one chance. Because before, the, I think the agencies facing this long list found it quite daunting. And it prevented them from keeping those positions open. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice Chair Duran. Thank you. I think it's a fantastic idea since we are having a shortage of uh, workers throughout um, our communities. It's not only in the state, it's also in the hotels as well as a lot of other uh, uh, businesses. Um, my question is, would you, once they get these positions, do, would ADA kick in for the accommodations of their disability to keep them employed? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Brown May, for the record. You'll notice originally that uh, actually, if you look at another section of the bill, ADA law is specific to all hires. And so um, you don't have to go through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation in order to qualify for accessibility um, uh, changes relative to the ADA. Um, the ADA would certainly be a part of this, right? So how do we make reasonable accommodations? But as part of our, our attempt to offer new employment opportunities for people who are perceived to not be able to provide the essential functions of a job, they go through that additional certification process through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. So all of those ADA um, accommodations could be part of this job development process and they work in partnership. I'd like to ask our uh, deputy administrator to talk a little bit about the process that the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation goes through to certify our folks and that might answer your question a little bit more. Thank you Assemblywoman Michelle Merrill for the record. Um, basically if an individual comes to Voc Rehab seeking services uh, to achieve employment and their goal is in state employment, then we will bring them into our 700 hour program which is currently run by Tammy Riley who is with us today. And what we will do is our counselors who are the case managers for all of the individuals with disabilities will look at the individual's background, they will look at their education, they will look at their experience and they're going to measure that against the job specifications and they're going to see if they meet those minimum qualifications before they can certify them for the list. And then if they are certified for the list then Tammy can get them on that official list that the agencies will have before them when they're looking to make a hire. Thank you. Is this, I appreciate the um, clarification on how that list gets started and you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. And just a quick question. So if, is there any concern that with this bill that there would be offices or administrators that might push people out in order to hire a different candidate? Assemblywoman Brown made for the record, that is a fabulous question. Uh, push people out of existing positions, is that where? What I would think is like, oh, okay, so we have an opening and then we have to hire somebody um, with Dieter, so we hire this person and give them the 700 hours, but I already know that I have this other candidate that I would like to hire, but as soon as those 700 hours are up, I can get rid of you. And are there any protections in place to protect the, that worker? Or are they still an at-will employee? Michelle Merrill, for the record, thank you very much for that question. It's a, it's a good question. And I think that we're hoping that this will change that. Because I think a lot of times agencies are instead just not filling the positions and they're holding them open. And what I would say is if they do have somebody that they've given a 700 hour opportunity to, and if it's not working out, that's what Voc Rehab is here for, so that we can come in, the counselor is still attached to the person, they, the case is still open, and we can work with the employer to try to address what their concerns are and preserve that employment opportunity, not lose it. That's our hope. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I, I look forward to continuing this conversation with the Assemblywoman uh, offline. I know that you really are a champion for our individuals with disabilities. And I, I know that the intent of this bill really is to ensure that we are giving job opportunities to those community members. Are there any additional questions from the committee? All right, thank you, I appreciate it. At this time, I will invite those wishing to testify in support of AB 79 here in Las Vegas, or I apologize, here in Carson City.
Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Eddie Avaliser on behalf of Tri Strategies, and I come to you this morning on behalf of Opportunity Village, Southern Nevada's favorite nonprofit that serves world-class service to over 3,000 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities throughout our Southern Nevada region. Um, we are in great support of this bill for a variety of reasons. One, opening the door for, for opportunities for many of our individuals in the community to access good jobs and to provide their skills and service to the state. Um, I will also mention in my prior life as the former administrator of Aging and Disability Services, I had not only the opportunity to work with Dieter on this program, and we've seen um, divisions and departments reticent in engaging in the 700-hour program, and this bill will, will rectify that. Um, I personally had the opportunity to work with many candidates in the 700 program and hired them for competitive long-term employment within our division. Um, and working with the folks at Voc Rehab is phenomenal. And so this bill will open up the door even more for individuals with disabilities to seek and access good jobs in this state. And we have a lot of vacancies in state jobs as it is. And so we encourage the committee to support this bill. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dylan Keith, Assistant Director of Government Affairs at the Vegas Chamber, and it is my pleasure to be in front of the hardest working committee uh, in the Assembly. We are in strong support of this bill, uh, addressing the labor shortage in the state, pub overall public and private sector. Uh, we have a population in Nevada that is trainable, able, and ready to get to work. Um, we are in strong support of this measure bringing forward that opportunity to people, and we urge your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to come testify in support of AB 79? In Las Vegas, is there anybody wishing to testify in support of AB 79? And in Car uh, BPS, is there anyone over the phone wishing to testify in support of AB 79? Testify in support of AB79. Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in support at this time. Thank you. Is there anybody wishing to testify, testify in opposition to AB79 here in Carson City? And it's good to see you in person, Ms. Martinez. I know you, that you've testified over the phone a couple times. So welcome to the hardest working, most fantastic committee on government affairs here in the assembly. Good morning, Madam Chair, Torres, and committee members. My name is Ellen Marquez. I am from Gardnerville, Nevada, and I'm the self-advocacy coordinator for the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. But today, I am here as a proud parent of a young adult with Down syndrome. I oppose AB 79 because of the addition of verbiage under C1 and 2, which allows state agencies to attempt this employment just once. If the person is not successful, the agency has done what is stated in the new verbiage. With the state of Nevada being the largest employer in our state, 
the state of Nevada should be setting the example of hiring people with disabilities, whether physical or developmental. In the state of Nevada, if the state of Nevada is encouraging the private sector to hire people with disabilities, the state of Nevada needs to put its foot forward and lead by example. Letting the communities in which people with disabilities live understand the state stands behind them. Limiting the amount of time a state agency should interview and accept a person with disabilities from the 700 hour program is showing the private sector there is no need to hire a person with disabilities. Within the 700 hour program, there are already 44 plus ineligible positions for people with disabilities, one of which is clerical trainee. There shouldn't be a limit on the opportunities available for the other positions. The employment rate for 2020. If you could just wrap up, thank you. Yeah, quickly. The employment rate for 2020 for people without disabilities was 75.8%, but the employment rate for 2020 for people with disabilities was 38.4% with Nevada ranking around 22nd in employing people with disabilities. Narrowing the opportunities for people Thank you, with disabilities. Thank you, Ms. Marquez. And if you could please just make sure you submit your written remarks to the secretary and we'll make sure that we get them all in the record. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Go ahead. Um, good morning. My name is Dora Martinez. Good morning, Madam Chair. It's so good to finally see you. <laughs> um, I. I do, I am in opposition of this, um, you know, disability justice requires systemic change and that re, we reimagine and build a world that values disabled people in our communities. And that is not rooted, that's not two minutes, is it? Tech issue, go okay, ahead. Okay, cool, I get extra one more minute. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, able supremacy, exploitation, oppression, violence, and most of all, discrimination. This bill, um, from what I could read, because it's, it's not 100% accessible, it, it, it does give a discrimination against what Ms. Um, Marquez was saying. Um, and just a side note, the video that Michelle Merrill was referring to is not ADA accessible. I couldn't even understand what was happening because I can't see, there's no audio description. So we, I, we really want to work with the person who's um, sponsoring AB 79, please work with us because we are here. When, when we leave, we go back to our lives with our kids and we are trying to get hired. And, and, and we haven't been able to be successful in that. This is our life and this is who we are and this is what we do, so please, I'm gonna close with a hashtag, nothing about us without us. Let, let's work together and make our voices heard and let's do equity and accessibility for all. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to see you and hear you. Thank you and thank you for your public comment and I, I encourage you to work with the bill sponsor. I'm sure that she'll be reaching out soon um, so that she can work with you on this bill. Uh, is there anybody else wishing to testify in opposition to AB 79 here in Carson City? In Las Vegas, is there anyone wishing to testify in opposition to AB 79? And please begin when you're ready. Please just make sure you state your name and spell your name for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Stephen Cohen for the record. Stephen with a V. Cohen is in the Assemblywoman, no known relation. I would echo Ms. Marquez's remark about the excluded positions. And to answer your question, Madam Chair, currently there are no protections. On January 2nd, 2019, I was let go through this program, having passed the program one month before my probation was up. I would encourage the committee to consider my amendments and the other two issues that I address therein, which are deficiencies in the Administrative Procedure Act, as well as the sovereign immunity statute. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield. 
Thank you. And committee members, I do believe that those amendments and those documents have already been posted on Nellis, so you may find them there as well. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in opposition in Las Vegas? BPS, is there anybody wishing to testify in opposition to AB 79 over the phone? To testify in opposition of AB 79, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Hello to everyone out there. Um, my name is May Hughes, um, M-A-Y-H-U-G-H-E-S. I am a totally blind mom and hoping to get a job. I am calling just to um, voice out that I oppose for the Bill 79 and um, people ahead of me that were opposing have already said so. Um, I hope you would hear our plea, please. Thank you, ma'am. And, and do you mind spelling your name for the record? Oh, I apologize. You did. Thank you. Oh, we appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody else, BPS? Chair, we have no additional callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, and I'll go ahead and invite the bill sponsor for any closing remarks. Oh, I keep forgetting neutral today. I guess it's one of those days. Anybody wishing to testify neutral to AB 79, please come up. Oh, and we have neutral too. Thank you for reminding me. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I will make this fast. I talk fast. My name is Katherine Nielsen. I'm the Executive Director for the Nevada Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. And this is Alyssa Marquez. She is our intern. And if you could please make sure you spell your name and her name for the record. Thank oh. you. Catherine, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, -E, Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, -E -E Alyssa, A-L-Y-S-A, -A, Marquez, M-A-R-Q-U-E-Z. All right, so working aged people with developmental disabilities and other disabilities are among the most un and underemployed segments of our society. Too often, unemployment is accepted as an inevitable result of living with a significant disability. Employment is the avenue to independence and increased socialization for individuals with disability. Our council believes that all individuals with disabilities who can and want to work should have access to the resources and supports necessary to gain and maintain meaningful community-based employment. The 700-hour program in and of itself needs major improvements in order to be successful. The current law allows for certain agencies to be exempt from using the 700-hour program. The term conflict of interest is also used but not defined. The new changes do not address these inadequacies. Additionally, the changes to this bill still permits agencies that have made at least one temporary limited appointment to a person with a disability the ability to bypass the 700-hour list of candidates in the future. As you've heard from other comments here today, if that person with a disability can do the job with or without supports, they should be considered with all other candidates. By allowing agencies the ability to claim exemptions, you have created a situation that will exclude candidates with disabilities from being considered again. We recommend you remove barriers that create disincentives for people with disabilities to find and maintain competitive employment. Employment includes supported employment, job training, and job coaching, which is done through the 700-hour program. With competitive wages in the community, these barriers include flexible options for on-the-job supports. We also recommend that you adopt proactive policies to ensure state agencies recruit, hire, train, and mentor people with disabilities in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that may have been more uh, opposition just per committee rules. So we are going to go ahead. We are neutral. We have to. It's education based. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. For the record, my name is Chris Sewell. I'm the director of Dieter. We use this program, it works. Now, I'm going to be very transparent, and I've been 
before several committees uh, this legislative session being very transparent. There are certain agencies in this state that if there's someone on the 700 hour list, they won't open up that open position. They'll wait until that list is, has zero on it. Then they open it up, open competitive. This change is a small change, but it's a start. To get these agencies to start hiring people with disabilities, that's where we need. We need to take this step now so that we don't have these issues in the future. Any one of us, I have six seconds, uh oh, any one of us could end up being a client of our vocational rehabilitation. Any one of us in this room. I go up skiing, I break both my legs, I might have to use their services get in a car accident, I might have to use their services. This may be a small step, but it's a needed step for everyone. So yes, I have to testify in neutral because I'm a state agency. I'm very transparent and I'm sure if you talk to some of your members of Ways and Means, they will also tell you I'm very transparent when it comes to things. But this is a small step and it probably needs to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Sewell. Um, uh, thank you for your transparency with this committee. Um, is there anybody else wishing to testify a neutral um, on AB 79 here in Carson City? In Las Vegas, is there anyone wishing to testify a neutral? And BPS, is there anyone on the phone wishing to testify neutral to AB 79? To testify in neutral for AB79, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you, Thelen Brown Me. Any closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate your time and consideration of this really important measure. As you can see, employment of people with disabilities is a significant issue and one that needs to be addressed. Uh, as a disability advocate for my entire life, I will tell you that every testimony that you heard today is 100% accurate. People with disabilities have been excluded from our communities for entirely too long. We have to all work together to eliminate the barriers that we experience. If we need to do this in a small step at a time, then that's the way we propose to do it. You heard from the director, the reality is people with disabilities who are certified on that 700 hour program are not accessing state employment opportunities because of the perceptions of the administrators. So we need to find a way to eliminate or change their perceptions about people with disabilities. Somebody asked me a long time ago, why did I have pink in my hair? I have pink in my hair because we all think when we look at each other that we see something. We recognize barriers, inefficiencies, inadequacies in each other, and we judge by appearance. That is so true for people with disabilities who present in a certain way. The discrimination that they face in how they engage our community is based on how they present. And when you're applying for a job as a person with a disability and you're in front of a non-disabled hiring manager, they are already determining whether or not they think you can do the job. When many times the reality is the person with a disability can do the job better than anyone else. We have to remove the barriers to find ways to enable people with disabilities to access employment. And if this is one small step to improve that outcome, then I think it's one we need to make. Now, you heard about a list as part of the comments. That is part of the application of this process in the state's human resources office. It is not an exclusionary list. 
um, as, as I think you heard. So it might have been misrepresented, and I'm happy to walk that through with you at any time offline to walk through the rest of it. I would love to work with all of our commenters to find a better way. It, this bill does not do enough. I agree with that. It is one good first step. Thank you. Thank you, San uh, and thank you for those remarks. All right, I think that that was a fantastic presentation. So at this time, I'll close the hearing on AB 79. And tomorrow, just a reminder to the committee, we will be in room. Yeah, we will be in room 4100. Uh, we will be hearing two phenomenal bills. Uh, one from our colleague, uh, Assemblyman Thomas, and also from Assemblyman MacArthur. It might only be his third pres book presentation, so I'm looking forward. I believe I will be uh, up there as well, so Vice Chair Duran will take over for a moment um, while Assemblyman MacArthur and I present our, our resolution together. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Anyone wishing to testify in public comment may come up here in Carson City or in Las Vegas. Every commenter will be given uh, two minutes to testify testify in public comment. In Carson City, I do not see anybody wishing to testify in public comment. In Las Vegas, I do not see anyone. BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in public comment over the phone? To provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Ian Marie Grant, A N N E M A R I E G R A N T. My brother Thomas Purdy was hogtied and asphyxiated to death by Reno Police and Washoe County Sheriff's Office during a mental health, price, health crisis. I'd like to talk today about Jacob Edwards, who was killed three years ago today. Sparks Police. He died almost instantly after his vehicle was struck head on by a truck operated by an alleged armed robbery suspect being chased by Sparks Police. Almost two years to the date that 30-year-old Jacob was killed, his family filed a lawsuit against the city of Sparks and the 15 officers allegedly involved in the fatal pursuit. Uh, the lawsuit claims a 20-minute long chaotic pursuit that at times reached 100 miles per hour and accuses the Sparks Police Department of violating standard protocols and intentionally covering up officers' conduct, sort of like they did when they murdered my brother. Some of the accusations included in the complaint are that officers ignored a sergeant's command to cease the pursuit. They drove vehicles 20 miles per hour over posted speed limits, which goes against standard pursuit policies, and they violated Department of Public Safety policies that officers are not to follow a vehicle driving the wrong way. Um, Jacob was not the, first, uh, the last person to die due to a reckless chase initiated by the officers. But those officers involved in Jacob's death are Mike McCreary, John Patton, Edith Dominguez, Nicholas Chambers, Angel Julian, Dan Snow, Jason Stone, Kimberly Hodge, Peter Loeschner, Rachel Arusam, Jay Agami, Robert Canterbury, Brian Sullivan, Patrick McNeely, and Chris Bracci. We need police reform. It shouldn't have ended at the 2021 legislative session. Thank you. Thank you, BPS next. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you. I will see everybody uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in room 4100. Hope everyone has a fantastic day. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>